Well, I've got a real treat for you in this video. A few weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to be on a US podcast, and I spent about an hour or so talking to a couple of great guys called Butch and Jeff. Here is the audio of that podcast. Now, because I don't want you to listen to an hour of my boring voice, instead of just putting a series of pictures as the video, I've actually gone back through my videos and I've picked out highlights from them. So it's almost like a greatest hits of things I've found and just things that I've been doing in my videos. So I hope you really enjoy this. I enjoy doing it and I'm actually contemplating setting up a UK metal detecting podcast. It's not simply because of the experience I had with Butch and Jeff, but because I think the UK needs one. It's a great hobby full of some awesome characters and I would like that to be brought to a, a wider audience. I know it's a fairly niche thing, metal detecting, but there's a lot of people listening to podcasts now. They're really easy to get. If you've got iTunes, just go to your podcast section, download them into your iTunes, put them on your iPlayer or whatever the hell it is you have. I've got Android systems, so I use something called... What's it called? Not Podcatcher. There's numerous apps you can get to get podcasts. What's mine? Podcast Addict. That's what mine's called. Unfortunately, I've smashed my good phone, so I can't show you it, but it really is easy to get. You just go into your app store, get something that pulls podcasts in, search for a genre or certain titles. They'll all come up, download them, see what you think, subscribe to them, and you'll get new ones sent every week or every time the producers make a new episode. They're excellent. That's pretty much all I listen to now, is podcasts. So that's the plan in 2015. To pull all the stuff out of my log cabin, make it into some sort of man cave, get recording gear in there, and run a podcast. Interview people from all around the world on Skype, and really get some interesting detecting stories put out there. I want to reach out to manufacturers, and and get a lot of information in there as well because the more information we have the better informed we are the better detectorists we are yes there's always going to be some clowns out there that make the hobby look bad but the simple thing is just don't include them they will not be mentioned I only want the good people and there's plenty of them out there these two guys who interviewed me for this podcast are two of the best Butch and Jeff so without further ado here is the podcast, and I hope you enjoy the video that I put together to go with it as well, because it took me bloody ages. Throughout history, empires have risen and fallen. The world has changed time and time again. But there is one element that has remained constant, gold. And now, the leader in the gold trade market, goldexchange.com, makes it easier than ever to buy and sell gold. The time to act is now. GoldExchange.com Deep in the woods, deep in the woods, it was ringing real good. Ten inches down, ten inches down, with a solid sound. Mule shoe, mule shoe, you're so sweet. I'm gonna take you home with me I dug it up I dug it up For my baby But he doesn't want it, no He says go Wash your hands Look what I found Underground For my baby But he doesn't Okay, folks, look what you have found once again on the internet. It is American Digger's Relic Roundup. I am your host and also publisher of American Digger Magazine. My name is Butch Holcomb. And if you are listening to this right now, which I really hope you are, this is a pre-recorded broadcast. So you're welcome to call in our phone lines, but don't expect anyone to answer. However, the chat room, of course, will be going strong as always. So Get on there and talk amongst yourself because Jeff and I are probably going to take a little time off tonight. Speaking of Jeff, Jeff is our co-host, Mr. Jeff Lubert. Are you there, my friend? I am, I am, I am. Thank you very much, Butch. I am Jeff Lubert talking to you out of Denver, Colorado. 
I'm also a board member of Eureka Treasure Hunters Club, and you can find out more about our club by going to the club website at www.eurekathc.com. Well, I tell you what, Butch, uh, since we're recording today and we are not mm-hmm. live, I'll just let you know that we have had some awfully chilly weather here in the Colorado area for the last week. Well, it's been over a week since we've actually been above freezing, and that's even the highs during the day. Um, I think today is about as warm as it's going to be for over the last week, and it's. I think we're supposed to hit a high of about 28 today. It was very cold here this morning, Jeff, in the southeast. Um, we were almost down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so uh, it did get up to about 50, though, and I actually spent this morning out metal detecting. Ha, <laughs> ha. Well, I hope you found something for the both of us, because I don't know that I'll be getting out anytime soon. It depends. How much do you like pool tabs and Budweiser cans, Jeff? <laughs> well, I'm not a big fan of them, but you know what? That's uh, some of the stuff we all have to go through, I guess. That is all I dug today. That was it. Um, hit some great sites, or potentially great sites, but um, it turned out that I just could not get my search coil over anything good. The best thing I dug, are you ready for this, was a 1989 penny. So, jeez, yeah, and I was I was happy to see it because at least I knew my detector was working properly. Well, absolutely, Not that uh, definitely gives though. you the indication that things are actually operational. Absolutely, Jeff. Absolutely. So, what machine were you actually using for this search today, well, Butch? Today, I was actually using my F seventy five, my Fisher F seventy five. I'm a big fan of that. Um, of course, I've got a, a regular stable of metal detectors. Depends on what I'm doing. Um, I like the F-75 for general relic hunting and coin shooting. I like the AT Pro for water hunting. I even like the, uh, I even use a Monolab GPX when I need to get the really, really deep stuff. But today it was the Fisher F-75. And you know what, Jeff? They're offering an upgrade now on the F-75. Have you heard about that? I have heard just, yeah. you know, the- a little bit more than rumors, but I know what's out there, and I haven't uh, gotten in-depth study on it yet. So, well, I was actually had mine completely packed up, ready to send it via the post office out to the Fisher folks to let them redo it. And a friend called me up this morning, wanted me to go metal detecting, <laughs> so I unpacked that sucker and went out there digging because that's what I do. Well, there you go. You know what? Uh, you can pack that thing back up tomorrow and, and fire it off in the mail. And uh, it, it realistically, from everything I've heard, will probably be back by next weekend. So They're, they're fast, so um, we're going to see how that works out, and we'll probably be talking about that on the show. Very good. Future that sounds show. awesome. Yeah, future show. So have you been able to go metal detecting this week, Jeff, at all, or has it been just too cold? It's just been too bloody cold. Uh, honestly, there was a day here uh, that the low temperature was 14 below zero. Good lord. Uh, yeah. Then you start throwing in wind chill. It was about 25 to 35 below zero that day. So uh, I really don't like to detect in that kind of weather. No, I suppose not. I suppose not. Um, wow. I, I don't know what to say about that, Jeff. <laughs> Burr. <laughs> Burr. That's right. Burr. <laughs> well, what I, 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 you know, I'm bundled up here, Jeff, because it may get down to freezing in the next month or two here. So I got to keep warm. Go ahead and curse me. Go I'll, ahead and cut me. Hope, I'll hope for the best for you, because you know what I uh, sitting here talking with uh, our guest beforehand mm-hmm. tonight, and uh, it sounds like they're actually getting some reasonable weather that you know yeah. might be able to go out and do do some detecting in, but. Even for them, it's a, a wee bit chilly, so it'll be interesting to uh, get their take on it. Well, I tell you what, Jeff, that sounds like a great segue into our guest tonight and also the reason that we are pre-recording this show, for that matter. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what is going on and who we're going to have on here and bring him on. Get this ball rolling. All righty, we'll get this ball rolling. Uh, tonight's guest uh, is coming from all the way across the pond. Uh, you've seen him on YouTube, or at least I hope you've seen him on YouTube. I really enjoy his videos, and I've actually been a subscriber now for a little bit, for a week or so, uh, once I discovered him, and uh, I really do appreciate him taking some time to join us tonight. We have uh, Richard, and a.k.a., I guess, Pond Guru. Are you there, Richard? I am indeed. Hello there. Hello, Richard. <laughs> i got to tell you, I, I really appreciate you joining us, and I know that... Uh, uh, part of it is, is you're across the pond there. You're about seven hours difference from me uh, here in Colorado and, and five hours difference from Butch. And I know you didn't really want to do a live show because I'd put you on air about 3 o'clock in the morning. So 
<laughs> Mind you, I, I'm, I'm quite often up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, but that's when you're getting your day started, though, right? Just about, yeah. It's not far off. All right. <laughs> uh, well, all right. So, why don't you tell our listeners, uh, uh, really, a little bit about yourself? You know, a little bit about your background. What is it you do for a living, and you know, uh, who you are. My name's Richard. I live in the northeast of England, just west of a town called Newcastle. Um, it's reasonably cold for most of the year up here. I'm married with two children. I live out in the country, and I have a ridiculous amount of land to hunt with a metal detector, but a very limited time to do it, because I don't get much time for this wonderful hobby, unfortunately. Oh. And you don't uh, have much time because uh, I assume it's from your handle that you have there on YouTube, which is Pond Guru. So it what is, is it you yeah. actually do for a living? That is actually changing. Up Uh-oh. until last up until last year, I was pretty much a pond installer, and I was doing all sorts of landscape and work uh-huh. and so on. But I started building up an online business on the side, selling associated filter media and so on, you know. And that has kind of grown to the point whereby I don't have time to put ponds in anymore. So that's that has slipped by the wayside, and now I'm an online seller. <laughs> wow. Well, that's good. That yes, hopefully right. will allow you a little bit more time to get out and do some detecting then. That's what I'm hoping. I'm just working through the last few little bits of pond jobs now, and working from home is absolutely ideal. It, to tidy the house, I can have the tea on the table. It, everything just works so much more smoothly. It's it's much better. Well, that is fantastic. Uh, and realistically, I mean, your hobby takes you out there digging, and your job takes you out there digging. I don't know, man. It's about, sounds like a lot of time with a spade in your hand. Uh, oh, I've dug plenty of holes <laughs> of all sizes and all depths. But one of the, one of the beautiful things is I do a lot of my work, or I used to do a lot of my work in the country, and quite often it was for landowners. So Back in the day, before I got back into detecting, I would ask them for shooting permission. And I would go up there and shoot rabbits and crows and so on, basically vermin control. And when I got back into detecting, I still had all those contacts. And everybody who I asked just said, no problem at all. They knew they could trust me with a gun on the land. So surely they can trust me with a metal detector. And it's just opened up a, a wealth of potentially good sites. I heard you mention that in the in the intro potentially good sites the all <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that we've run into here in colorado uh my partners and i uh ron linder erickson we've run into some you know really good potential sites this year that really haven't panned out but that's the way it goes that's why we go out there and do it you just never you know know what you're gonna find no, or not the find. world the world's full of potential good metal detecting sites absolutely <laughs> all righty so uh i'm trying to look through my notes here and see what we sh- should be uh, oh. talking about, but we already discussed you're in the northeast of England, and I've actually uh, detected up in that area myself a couple times. I envy uh, both of you guys, what? by the way. England is on my bucket list. Um, one day I'm going to get over there, and it's going to be the metal detect, so one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife and I one time took a trip, and we uh, stayed in New York for a few days, and uh, I rented a bicycle and tried going around to the farms around town and knocking on doors and see if they'd let me detect and didn't have any success with that until uh we we're actually out driving around uh, i think we're up near oh uh, gosh i couldn't even tell you where we're at we're northeast of town a little ways and finally i convinced someone to let me on their land for about an hour is all i had time for so mm-hmm. didn't find much i did get one really really slick copper um looks like it's probably from the 1700s um but i was quite happy with that i i Pulled probably about 15, 20 pounds of iron out of their pasture and and uh, <laughs> had a heck of a good time. Getting permissions is extremely hard. And I would imagine it's the same right throughout the world. It but is. there's, there's a, such a pressure over here for permissions because there's so many people into the hobby and there's so few landowners willing to let people on the land now. And that's where you're having that previous contact with people really helps to open it up as opposed to just being a cold, as we call it here, a cold call where you're just kind of walking up, knocking on the door, or in some cases, you know, you have to 
do a phone call or a letter to to try and get an introduction in. Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine how difficult and frustrating that is for people because I'm I'm really fortunate that I've never had to do that. You know, um, I I couldn't imagine doing that, and I, I would. I'm not the sort of person that just goes and knocks on doors and asks people without actually giving them something in return first, without do, either doing a service for them or yeah. providing them with some uh, something that they've bought from me or something like that, some sort of previous contact, you know? Right, and 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 that's part of metal detecting. You know what? Uh, here in the U.S., a lot of times you just have to go up and start knocking on doors and figuring out yeah. who's who owns what land. Hopefully you got it figured out before you do, do that, but <laughs> sometimes, you know... You, you don't realize that that house that's there on the land is a rental and the person that owns it is, you know, two counties away or whatever. So you just got to go and knock on the door and figure it out. Has that's all, it. That's all you, all, you, all, you, all, all you can do. Yep. Has the Antiquities Act over there helped as far as getting permission, you think, the people that do have to knock on doors? Because I know that the way I understand it, that if something good is found and the museums buy it, then the property owners get to share in the profit. Do you think that helps them any or, or not? Um, if landowners are aware of that, uh-huh. yes, because uh-huh. really, that at the end of the day, they're getting paid for doing nothing, just for letting somebody go on their land, you know. But um, the problem is, if something is found on their land, quite often they can be besieged by people knocking all the time, asking uh-huh. them yes. for permission. That can get very wearing for them, and quite often they just say, nobody's detecting on here at all. It's not worth the hassle. I can understand that. Yeah, and then I've also ha- heard of, you know, if a good discovery gets uh, found on a piece of land that, uh, you know, sometimes the land gets scheduled and mm-hmm. therefore it can affect things like future expansions of a house or, oh, boy, you know, yeah. diggings of, of other sorts that you're trying to put in, you know, whether it's a sewer line or who knows what else. So It can, and most of the archaeological sites that are being excavated at the moment have initially been found by metal detectorists finding little artifacts, reporting them to the find li- finds liaison officer, part of the portable antiquities scheme, and then th- the archaeologists getting involved and actually scheduling the site, you know? Right, so, and that's fantastic that they're following the, the, the law as written, you know, reporting all that good stuff, and, uh, you know, doing well, it properly, yep. so. It's it's essential, it's, it, it has to be that way, otherwise the hobby's dead. Do the they... hobby needs honesty like that. Do the do the archaeology? Okay, over here in the states, we we unfortunately have a problem with the archaeologists that just do not like metal detectorists. Is that the same over there in England? In other words, do the archaeologists um not really like having to deal with the metal detectorists? Uh, yeah, okay. that goes back a long way as well. And often now, unfortunately, they they're starting to reference YouTube videos and and citing those certain people as being perfect examples of bad detectorists and that's what they're all like according to them you know it's so whilst youtube has been excellent for promoting the hobby it's also good for the archaeologists who have a vendetta against some of the archaeologists who have a vendetta against the detectorists to use certain videos against the hobby which isn't it's not ideal you know and and that's where it is a a two-edged sword it is Uh, yeah yeah because, uh, honestly, the way I look at it, the archaeologist, by having such a negative uh, negative image of metal detectorist, um, it makes the metal detectorist not want to share what they find. I know it's the law over in England, but, you know, over here, um, it just, the metal detectorist take the attitude of fine. If you want to, um, to think of us as looters and thieves, we just won't tell you what we're finding, and it's really sad yeah there's there's quite a lot of that goes on unfortunately i'm i'm lucky that i don't associate with anybody like that because our local club the the finds liaison officer that comes in is a really nice guy called rob collins from the the hancock museum at um newcastle and he he is really pro detector and there's actually a site quite near me where the club's been hunting quite a lot. And they found a lot of Roman stuff. They found Celtic stuff. They found all sorts of artifacts. And at one of the club meetings, the, the finds liaison officer, Rob, actually came to the meeting. And he had a full slideshow and graphs and charts and everything showing when this site had had been under the most occupation and 
oh, that's plotting cool. all the finds on maps and everything. It, it was really great. You know, he'd really done an excellent service for the detectorists. So, you know, the, as much as some archaeologists really don't like detectorists, there are a lot who really appreciate them as well. That, that is good, yeah. And, and you know what? I, I think the, the ones that really don't like the detectorists are more the old school archaeologists. Although I, you know, I got this funny feeling they're being taught that in school nowadays they are. that they, they don't like them. But you know what? I think the tide is turning and, and we're heading in a proper direction. And part of it is thanks to the, the English uh, portable antiquity scheme. So I really mm-hmm. applaud that and, and really, you know, hope that the U.S. will start heading in that direction in the, in the near future. So, yeah, yeah. All right, so you're sitting there talking about, you know, the, these uh, videos, YouTube videos are kind of a, a double-edged sword, or as I, uh, I guess I put it that way. Now, why is it that you actually make the videos? I mean, I've seen your videos, and my gosh, I really <laughs> enjoy them a lot. They're That's actually probably my favorite YouTube channel. This isn't metal detecting related, but part of the reason why I make videos is because I've got awful problems with memory. So really, it's an online memory bank for me, it, so I can actually rem- look and see what I've what I've found and where I've been. You know, that's excellent. <laughs> well, I say a lot of people write down logs and stuff. Yours is just a video log of of what you find and where you find it. Pretty much, yeah. And I also like to make the odd video that that helps people with settings and search techniques and so on. And 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 when I can, I like to explain a little bit about the site and what I'm expecting to find, or should I say, what I'm hoping to find. You know, I don't just like to go out and have a camera in my pocket and just video the finds and you know really make a, a shaky, wind affected video. I like to try and make it watchable. You know, just just so it's a bit of an experience for people. And that, like I said, that's part of the reasons why I really uh, enjoy your your. YouTube channel so much. There's a couple of uh, guys out there I found that uh, really have some quality videos like that where they talk about, you know, the actual history of the item and the area surrounding where they're searching. And, and uh, boy, I tell you what, those are definitely my favorite YouTube channels. I've seen really? far too, yeah, I've seen far too many videos out there of, you know what, here's my find. Yeah, All right, that, here's yeah, my next find. Here's my next find. It, you know, yeah, it just yeah. shows things with no context at all. There's actually a, an excellent lad in Germany called Hans. has a channel called Terra Germania. I don't know whether you've seen him. I've not I seen have. that one yet. I'll have to check that out. He's a really nice fella, and he, he presents the videos really well. His English is excellent, and everything's done on a tripod so that the, the shots are still. He has a proper mic. There's not there's not no wind noise, and everything's filmed really beautifully. Shots of the countryside, and he explains about where he's hunting and everything. He's a, he makes really good videos. And what was that YouTube channel again, or his handle? It's Terra, which is T E double R A. So Terra, as in Earth. Yep. And Germania, as in German, with an E on the end. Oh, Terra okay. Germania. Yeah. I probably pronounced that wrong, but. <laughs> I, I, I first started watching his videos about 18 months ago, and, and I, I really appreciate the, the effort that he puts into the videos. He, he makes a really good job. And I think that's great what you talk about, um, the way that you do your videos, and I guess he does his videos as well, is, um, you know, you're using it as a teaching tool, so I think that's very important. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had the chance to get out detecting for a couple of weeks, but the last detecting video I did was of air tests, which aren't perfect, but air tests for the Mine Lab E-Track. I got 67 different UK coins, and I tested them over the coil, and I recorded the, the tones and also the ID numbers as well and put all of those into a video. And it took the best part of a day to film and edit, but it's, it's really worth it. It's fairly specific to the UK, but just for for folks looking at that video and then thinking, my God, do you know, I had a, a signal the other day that read 10, 14. That could have been a half sovereign. I just ignored it. Let's get back on that site, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I actually watched that video and, and enjoyed it. I do not have an E-Track, but I do have the CTX. So the next time over there, I will be definitely be reviewing that because I'm sure the IDs are going to be very close, if not exactly the same. So I think they are. Is, is it split... Oh, 40 down and 50 across? I believe so. I do not actually... Like I said, I've just purchased the machine probably a month ago, and I'm literally just just starting to scratch the surface of it. So I, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm 
I'm 99% sure that they are identical in their ID screens. Yeah, I just love the idea that the the target can hit anywhere. I, just, I, just, I love the idea that it can hit anywhere within 2,000 places on the screen because that's really specific. It, it's not just a simple yeah. beep and dig. You can look at that screen and you can say, you know, I think this is an old penny or, ooh, that might be a sixpence. It's, right. it's so, so specific as to what it could be. And and you know what? I am more of a tone hunter than an ID hunter. Uh, I've learned that over the years, I guess. I, I listen more to the tones than I do the screen, but I find that with the Mind Labs that that screen really does add a tremendous amount of information that uh, I haven't gotten on some of the other ones. So I agree with that, that it that ability to grid that find out is just fantastic. It does. I also love the tones as well. I tend to hunt in four-tone ferrous, so all of my good targets will give a lovely, clean, high tone. <laughs> and that's part of being able to understand that e-track or in, in my case the ctx and customize it uh, i wouldn't suggest that a lot of people get out there although that is a, a preset uh on the e-track um you know what if you're going to just get in start messing with the the programming i hope that there's an easy way to reset that because uh, it is easy to mess up it is you can you can really mess it up if you if you didn't know what all the settings did and you just changed it for the sake of it it would really affect the machine <laughs> so what other machines do you actually use we know now that you use a, an e-track so what other machines uh, or machine do you actually use I either use the e-track or the XP Deus well, okay. a lot of good things about that as well the Deus the yeah. Deus is an extremely sharp machine very sharp and the, although I don't like the tones on it the this, oh, it's just so good in iron. If you have an irony sight, it identifies the targets within loads of little iron targets extremely well. And it gets very small targets at a reasonable depth as well. It's a good machine. Very yeah. lightweight, too, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. well, when... uh, it's, it's very good on plowed land where you want to quickly find hot spots. You can just whip it backwards and forwards, and it, it's just so sharp it, it picks up the slightest little signal. Oh, excellent. I've seen some of your videos, so I already know the answer to this question. But do you use a, a uh, electronic pinpointer as well? I do. I favor the Garrett pinpointer. I, I have had a mine lab one as well. I actually got one of those when they first came out because apparently they did, they did a little bit better as far as depth was concerned. And because I hunt mostly in pasture, a, a lot of deep holes, you really need just as, as much sensitivity as you can of, to find the deep targets, you know. And I, I bought one, and the air tests were very encouraging, but when I actually used it in the ground, in, in real-world conditions, it just didn't perform as well as the Garrett, so I sent it back. Yeah, there you go. There's quite a, a testament for that Garrett Pro Pointer. Oh, it is. It's, it's excellent. The only thing that I don't like about the Garrett is the switch. The water and muck gets in the switch, yeah. and that has been the death of two or three of them. But now I use a, a, a cover. There's a fellow on eBay who sells them, and they really keep the muck out. The, underneath this cover, it's just as new, and that's going to wow. extend its life immeasurably. Yeah, yeah. I, like I said, I've seen your videos, and I've watched uh, many of them, so I already knew that you were using that cover, and that was one of those points of conversation I wanted to get to, and I appreciate you getting there for me. Uh, what does one of those little covers cost? I mean, is it? It's just a for Where you, you a pound or two, isn't it? One. It's not very expensive. It, I, yeah, I think they're only either four pound ninety nine or five pound ninety nine, but they're, they're really cheap and they last fairly well. Even when you're really scraping them through the soil, it takes a while to wear one away, okay. but they really do protect the probe. I, I would call them an essential purchase. And in fact, I, not so long ago, I bought a backup probe, which was another mine lab probe. And on the day that I bought the probe, I bought a cover as well. Okay. And so they make them actually for multiple machines. They're not just for the Garrett Pro Pointer. Because I, I see them, they look like they're pretty much custom fit for the Pro Pointer. But I guess I have not seen one of the, the Mind Lab Pro Pointers yet, so I don't know if they're yeah, that the, close. The guy that makes the probes that I, uh, the, the, the covers that I buy, he definitely makes them for the Mind Lab, for the whites, and. Um, think for another one as well maybe there's another two or three different probes 
But yeah. they, they, they all do exactly the same job. They all really extend the life of the probe, which is very important. Does it make it waterproof as well? No. Okay. The, the, the end is actually open, the bottom end, okay. where, where the detection oh. is. Um, and the top is just a cap that goes on. So okay. whilst they would withstand washing, a heavy, heavy wash under a tap, yeah. they won't withstand being submerged in water. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Now, you've been doing videos for a while, um, from what I've seen. Uh, are some of your better finds that you've made actually on video, or, or you know, is it one of those things where you, you started doing your your videos after you really started coming up with some decent finds? Mm, no, I would say the better finds are pretty much in the videos. They're very spread out because I've got quite a few videos, and a lot of them are quite long. But I would say the vast majority of the better finds are in the videos. So there you have it. There's there's some pretty cool finds that I've seen, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I was also uh, sitting there watching one of the videos. It's one of your videos, I think, from earlier in the year, if not last year. And you're talking about that, um, you know what, there isn't many hammered coins being found in the pasture lands that you typically like to hunt. Now, why is that? Yeah. That that intrigued me. In pasture, if the, if the land hasn't been grazed for two or three years in a row, you get a lot of vegetation building up, it dies, it sinks down back down to the ground, more vegetation grows up, dies, sinks to the ground, and the, the ground actually builds up, and the fines get lower and lower and lower every year, whereas cultivated land, often the land's been cultivated since the stuff's been getting spread on it centuries ago, and it keeps getting brought up to the top. So with cultivated, like ploughed and seeded land, you can just fly over, and you can find a lot of great stuff within certainly within the top three inches but in pasture you've got to go a bit deeper generally to, to find the the better finds you know absolutely and i know when i was in england uh one of my favorite found, finds that i made was a a shipyard token i believe it's dated 1664 but that was actually in a pasture land i think i ended up with a rose farthing as well so uh, I actually, right, yeah. yeah yeah i ended up with a couple of nice finds out of pasture land so. One of the first really old coins that I got was a rose father, and it was actually when I was searching on somebody's land for a gold ring that the lady had lost. And it took me ages to, to actually find the ring, but I did find it in the end. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. What is a rose farthing for those that don't know, including myself? Oh, it's a tiny little hammered copper coin about the size of your little fingernail. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't even know if it's that big. Is it silver? <laughs> no, they're very small. <laughs> a silver coin? No, they're no, copper. No, copper. Copper. Oh, okay. That That is small. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and and you know what? Uh, if anyone is going over to England uh, or is in England actually listening or, and they're first starting to get in detecting, there's a couple of books out there uh, about English coinage that you probably should have. And, and you know, one is called a Spinks and the other one... Uh, I have is is uh, published by CB, so um, those are great books. Mine are older ones, but they are still, you know, give you great identification uh, to the English coinage, and definitely, I think, uh, an essential. Yeah, I've got a couple of the Spink books. I've actually just won a Spink book, the latest one, the 2014 one. It was another metal detecting channel had a competition. I can't even remember what it was for. I think you maybe had to guess how many coins were in a jar. And luckily, I guessed within one of the actual figure. So I won that. Yeah. And it's it's a really excellent book. It, I, I can definitely recommend that. It was actually at, it was at a channel called Rich Biss, a lad called Rich. He's another UK detectorist. And um, I won a Spink book. There was a book on, another book on English coins. And there was a Roman a map of Britain as well, which is excellent. It shows all the Roman roads for the whole of Britain. Oh, my. Which is, it's really good because in my area, there's roads that I, I didn't even know were there. So there's flat pasture next to it. I'm thinking, my God, I've got permission there. I've got to go there. There was a Roman road used to go through there, you know. Yeah. And I tell you what, we'll get back to that right after some commercial breaks. we got to go out and pay some bills. What do you think about that, Butch? I think that's a fine idea, Jeff, and we will be right back to our guest from over in England after these words from our sponsors. Have a great flight, honey. Oh, no, I forgot my American Digger magazine. What am I going to do? Well, you have Internet access, right? Yeah. 
Oh, I see. You mean I can read it digitally. Let me go to the website and get a copy right now. Hey, that was simple, and now I can read it on my flight. Or your destination. I'm not sure they have it on the newsstands in Hong Kong. No matter where you go, there we are. American Digger Digital Editions, available now. Join us at TomsTreasuresForum.com. They have over 1,400 members and still growing. They have great reference section, useful tips, experienced metal detectors, and relic hunters to help identify your finds. Membership is free. Join them at HTTP, TomsTreasuresForum.com. Hope to see you there. Okay, folks, we're back to American Diggers Relic Roundup. This is a pre-recorded show, so we're not taking calls tonight. But, of course, you can go to our chat room and talk amongst yourselves. That's a lot of fun for a lot of people. So, uh, Jeff, I'm a little older and more forgetful for you than you. So, exactly where were we at with our questions? Well, we were just sitting there talking with Richard about uh, uh, yes. Spink's book, and, and he actually yes. ended, ended up with another book that had uh, maps of old Roman roads in there. Ah. Now, did did you actually get out and start looking for this remnants of these Roman roads, or or maybe even just get to the libraries and try to find a little bit more and better detailed maps? I haven't had a chance yet, but this map is, is very detailed. It's it's as detailed as you're ever going to need. If you can recognize the, the, the site where the, the road goes through and you've got permission, you, you can pinpoint where they might have stopped, where they might have camped, uh, you know, where they might have just stopped to fill up drinking vessels in, in the river and there might be things there, you know. I've only had it for a couple of weeks, so I haven't had a chance to act on any of the information that's in it, unfortunately. <laughs> so it is a real new book. Yeah, I thought this is, from the way we were talking, I thought this is maybe a, a book that you got a couple months ago, but wow, no, it's no. new and exciting information. What was that book it again, is. Jeff? Uh, it, it's called The Book uh, Butch Doesn't Need to Know. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah. No, it, it's actually a map. It's a fold-out map. Oh, it's a fold-out map. It, it's from the Spinx book, though? No, no, it's just a, a map. I think it's an ordinance. Oh. might be an ordinance survey map. I'm not entirely okay. sure. Wow. Talk about a great uh, little prize, too. Oh. Only Jeff, oh, Jeff, only Richard and myself know about this map, so sorry. <laughs> it doesn't apply to you. So uh, do you guys actually get to detect all year round there in the north of England, or do you actually have, like, winter season, kind of like we have here, where it's below freezing and the ground is all frozen, and, well, you just got to sit here and look around and watch videos for the rest of the season? Uh, I think two out of the last three winters have been pretty much written off by snow, but that is a rarity. Generally, it's just fairly wet and cold and miserable and dark. <laughs> and I tell you what, uh, being that I am in an area where there isn't a whole lot of humidity, um, that, that cold that you guys have is a whole different kind of cold than what I'm used to, and it is bone-chilling. Oh, it's awful. I was actually working in a pond on Friday, and when I got there, it was raining. The lad who was supposed to be helping me wasn't available. I, I called in, he just wasn't there. So I decided to do it by myself. And, and by lunchtime, I was absolutely wet through and it was horrible. <laughs> absolutely horrible. I won't miss that sort of work at all. <laughs> well, that's good that, uh, you know, your other business is picking up and, and you can actually leave that to the younger crew out there, I guess. You know, it's, I think that is more of a, a young man's job to go out there and be digging those big old holes and putting in the, the ponds for these people. So definitely, without <laughs> a doubt. <laughs> All right, so you were mentioning before that you belonged to a club. I, I did belong to a club. My local club's the Bladen Search and Recovery Society. But because of the pressures of the work that I've got and not knowing how busy I'm going to be from day to day and the amount of clubs that my children do, uh, I actually went up to the to the club one of the on one of the meeting nights and uh, I resigned from the club because there was a waiting list of people wanting to be in. And I was really just although, you know, I got on really well with the lads and they were saying, oh, no, no, don't leave the club, you know. I'm saying, well, I haven't got time to go to the digs and I can only make some of the meetings. You've got fellas waiting to be in who are really keen and they're going to be able to go on the digs. So I, I, I resigned my place so that other people could get in because they have a cap on how many people can get in. But when I was in the club, um, the, the fellas were really, really nice fellas, quite a lot of older guys. And the shared information and settings and tips and, you know, information about sites, really freely, a really nice group of fellas. Wow, that sounds <laughs> amazing. I would uh, 
love to to join one of those clubs or at least go to a club one time over there in England just to see what they talk about and and uh, see some of the fines that they make. Um, yeah, because that would be yeah. Cool. Every month they have a, a find of the month competition. So anybody that's been on the digs brings their best finds. So they have a best artifact and the best coin find, and they lay them all out on the table and they, they pick somebody at random out of the club to go and judge them. And it's it's really good. I, I used to, I used to love going there, you know. <laughs> and it sounds like uh, the clubs there are quite a bit different than they are here in the U.S. So. Um, it'd be neat just to get that different perspective and it is neat that uh, actually that the clubs do digs and, and from what I hear some of them do digs once a week sometimes even as much as a couple times a week um, yeah yeah they, they used the club used to actually do one on a Sunday and I think on a Wednesday as well but the fines from the Wednesday didn't count it was only the Sunday one when most of the club was actually off and available to attend but as far as I know, I think they might have stopped the Wednesday one. And quite a lot of the time, the, the guys just go out with each other, just on different sites. Right, and it's, that's part it's of... a really friendly club. And that's part of being with a club, is that, uh, you know what, you're going to meet some people that maybe you didn't know were detectorists or, you know what, that live a little bit farther away than what you'd normally travel. But, you know what, you get along with them, so the you know they might be a new detecting partner. And, uh, and they'll get you into land that they have available, and you return, get them into land that that you have available to you. So that's, I love yep. that about clubs. Yep. Uh, and really for people who have difficulty getting good sites, if they can join a club, it is a good way to get onto some really productive land. Yeah. Yeah. Especially over there in the UK here in the U S like I said, we don't uh, typically have like what you're saying. There's uh, I, what I've seen over there in the UK is that there is someone that actually, that's what they do is they go out and line up, land for the club to go out and dig on whereas here in the u.s that's almost unheard of hey jeff i'm moving yes. to the uk <laughs> <laughs> just make sure Where? you have a two-bedroom uh, a place so that oh, diane and i can I've, come over I've and join been, you i've been in this hobby for oh my gosh more years than i want to think of and um that's just i i, I mean to imagine clubs that actually go out and find places to hunt you know um it's a lot different than it is here, that's for sure. I always presumed it was pretty much the same in the U.S. Because uh, whenever I watch videos of, of group hunts, I, I just assumed it was a club on a, on a piece of club land, you know? Well, the, the problem that we run into over here is we do not have as many years of occupation and as many people that have inhabited the land. Uh, you know, our, our history runs pretty much from the early 1700s, and that was it. And um, their sites are just not as productive, even though they look productive on um, on some of the YouTube videos and all. Uh, it's really competitive to find a good site over here. So I think that's what a lot of mm -hmm. it is. Right. Yep. Some of the finds that I see coming up from the U.S. are very good, though. You know, the, the, the fact that they're not thousands of years old, it's, it's really irrelevant. It's yeah. the scarcity of the finds. This is, this is true. And um, a lot of our sites, I think, are smaller here as well. Um, in fact, <laughs> not to plug my snake buckle video, but you saw that, Jeff. All of them, we found 20-something snake buckles in two and a half days, and the area was about 40 feet across. So, you know, stuff is found here. Oh, and like we discussed some in some earlier shows that, uh, you know, you really should only rate your finds on the area which you're this hunting at. Pretty, I mean, you can't expect to go out and find colonial items here in Colorado. And, uh, you know what, if you're going out and finding or expecting to or hoping to find things from the, the early 1800s to late 1700s, it's not going to happen here. Uh, you have to be happy with the coin from the early 1920s or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, just be happy with... You know, if you're at the beach, go looking for beach stuff. And, and if you get something historic in there, great. You know, that's just don't set your goals for unrealistic, unattainable goals. Uh, that's that's, right. You know, be happy with, like I said, you know, when you go to England, then you can go hope for maybe a Roman site or, you know, some medieval or some hammered or, you know, Anglo or, or something along those lines. But you have to be in the right spot once again. You can't expect to go out and find a, a Roman site just by hitting some random field. You have to do a little bit of research. You have to study it. And uh, you know what? Spend some time in the field. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, research is quite a big thing. There's a lot of dead land, although it's been occupied for thousands of years over here. There's a lot of land where very little happened. And and That's true. just That's because uh, I say you've done your research, you've looked at all the maps, and uh, you know what, nothing looks like it ever happened out in that field. That doesn't mean nothing ever happened out in that field. Maybe there was a little skirmish that never got written down. Uh, maybe there was a house site there that never got written down. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Go ahead oh, and yes. give it a try. There's definitely a lot of either forgotten or lost history in the UK. Exactly. So it, it, it's what I'm saying is, is don't be you know scared to go out and hit that field because you can't find any written history on it. Just go give it a try. If you have permission to go do it, go give it a try. You know what? If it wastes a, a half a day or even two, three hours of your time, so be it. Um, at least you're out there swinging the quail and maybe you'll find that ring that the farmer lost or you know even just a... A few pennies, you know, from over the years, from when that field was well, getting tilled. And, and I believe, I believe, like you do, Jeff, don't ever turn down permission to go metal detecting. However, Richard is right. There's a lot of dead land, but an experienced detectorist can tell fairly quick by performing a search back and forth on the property. You know, if you're not finding a lot of uh, debris, iron, iron nails, um, you know. Anything other than farm equipment, if you're not finding something that shows someone lived there, you might be better off where you actually know where there's some occupation. But you do have to check the sites, that's for sure. Absolutely. And I tell you what, um, there's been a couple times where I've been to bed and breakfast in England. They own a small amount of land, whether it's you know, 15, 20 acres. I ask them if I can go out and detect. They say, you know, and they kind of look at me kind of like I'm strange. And well, I go out and detect, and... Granite in the UK, you know, the, the, the newer stuff, as they call it, um, isn't really all exciting to them. But, you know, I went out and found on the one bed and breakfast land, I got a couple pennies, and the one was from 1864. Not old for the UK, and I, I've actually watched some guys pitch those pennies into the hedgerows where I was so excited to find an 1864 penny, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, just like I said, just be happy with what you find and... Hey, you know what? Jeff, you know, we're yes. sitting here talking about clubs and things like that. Well, guess what? It's time for another break, and I believe that your very own club is coming up on one of these breaks. So shall we go listen? Well, let's go give it a try. Well, let's. Folks, we will be right back to American Diggers Relic Roundup after these words from our sponsors. Eureka Treasure Hunters Club out of Denver, Colorado. We are your Colorado club, whether you're into relic hunting, auto collecting, prospecting, coin shooting, or arrowhead hunting. Stop by our website at www.eurekathc.com. That's E-U-R-E-K-A-T-H-C.com. Click on the newsletter tab to read our latest newsletter and see some of the great finds coming out of Colorado. Also in the newsletter, you'll find information on how to become a member and when and where the club meets as well as contact information in case you're coming to Colorado and would like someone to detect with. Remember, that is EurekaTHC.com. DNR Studio, the producers of Phil Lay's Civil War CDs, Campfires and Battle Cries, and the new CD, Heart Tack and Gunpowder, can mix, master, and produce your CD project as well. Visit www.dandrstudio.com for a look at the studio and production facilities and for complete contact information. Okay, folks, we are back to American Diggers Relic Roundup. This is a pre-recorded show tonight, so do not try to call us because we won't answer. Isn't that right, Jeff? That is so true. You know what? Uh, this is awesome to get to talk to a it gentleman such as Richard. So. And I really enjoy this time. It, it really is. And, you know, I'm looking through our show notes here, and um, one thing that I keep looking at, and I know it's mentioned on the videos too, but, Richard, tell us about this bag of shame that you talk about. <laughs> Got to know. Really, <laughs> the bag of shame is just anything that won't go in my collection so there's a oh there's a nation of copper coins in there old buckles old buttons stuff that's reasonably interesting but just not interesting enough to to really show anybody <laughs> and, and what are your plans for that bag of shame 
I actually give quite a lot of it away. A lot of the coins I just give away. I actually ran a competition a few weeks ago, and there was a guy in America won it. I cannot remember his name. It might have been Mike, I think. I'm terrible with names. But um, he said, oh, thanks very much for the chance to win something. I'm so glad that I won. Is there any chance of any of the coins out of your bag of shame? So I, I sent dozens of coins out to <laughs> Oh, yeah, and, and like I was saying, you know what, uh, those coins from the 1700s, the, those old slick coppers that you guys get, you know, into the, even to the late 1800s, us guys in the U.S. love those coins that are, you know, 1700s, 1800s, absolutely love that stuff, so. Richard, it doesn't know. take a lot to make us Yanks happy. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, one one thing I really like watching on the American videos is what you find from the Civil War. Oh, yeah, because that's a lot of, been my a lot of the war a lot of the wars that shaped our country and really d defined us as a country were so far back that we find very little from them. And on the, on the battlefields in medieval times, the bodies were absolutely stripped of anything metallic because metal had such a, a high value. You know, they could, they could melt it down into something else or they could reuse the parts of armor. So the, there's very little on battle sites over here. And, and that is something that... that me in particular have been blessed with living in the southeast of the United States. Um, well, the the town that I live in, which is Ackworth, Georgia, was a supply depot for both the Confederates and Yankees during the Civil War, and they were all around here. And that has actually been what got me into metal detecting and is still my main love. It's getting hard to find now because there's so many people that go after it, but um. You know, okay, so the stuff is, you know, maybe 150 years old. It's not it, that old in the overall scope of things, but my God, it's historic. It's just really, really cool to find. So um, maybe it one is, day you can get over here, we'll take you to a Civil War site. That would be awesome. Yeah, Likewise, you can come to some of my sites. Yes, I would love that. Yes. Give me an excuse to get out. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> hey, you know what? We were just sitting there talking about what got Butch into detecting. Uh, what actually got you into detecting, Richard? Um, years ago, my father used to own a sawmill, and he used to get a lot of wood from Eastern Europe, where there was a lot of heavy fighting in Russia and so on. And quite a lot of the time, he would run a metal detector over the wood, over the big logs, before he put them through the saws in the sawmill. So I used to take the metal detector and go out into the local fields and see what I could find. And To be honest, I just found a right load of rubbish in the the novelty of it wore off fairly quickly. But a few years ago, um, I just decided to get back into metal detecting again, maybe it's, mm, four years ago or so, maybe it's a bit longer. So I bought a Garrett Ace 150, which is where quite a lot of people start. And I thought I would just go out in the same fields that I had hunted when I was a child. Uh, and I started finding things from the 1700s. I found a, a nice snake buckle, spindle whirls. I didn't find anything of massive value but it, it re the bug really got me then and I went straight from the 150 to the e-track well that's quite a jump <laughs> it is but the finds the difference in, in not only the quality and also the depth of the finds that I made with the e-track was unbelievable the 150 was really hunting the first 4 to 6 inches but with the e-track straight away I was in the coins 10 12 inches down that other detectors just didn't touch i was going on places around my around my local area that had really been hunted quite hard in the 80s and 90s with other detectors and it was just like a new site you'd think nobody had been there because they weren't getting down as far what a difference it made well and, and not only that but like you're saying you know what if these fields have been plowed and, and tilled that will bring stuff to the surface that was not detectable years ago. And if no one's been on that field for 15 years and it's been plowed 15 times since then, it's going to bring up new targets. Oh, they do. But, I mean, this was mostly pasture that I was hunting. Oh, so the, wow. the difference wow. was really apparent. And I had hunted it myself as well with the, the 150, but it just wasn't getting the depth. The e-track just got that depth, and it gave those lovely tones, and you get the really clear ID at the depth as well. And I absolutely love it because the field in front of my house is huge. There's got to be some excellent finds still out there. And almost every every dig that I do is deep. I, I can't remember finding anything under eight inches in that field. Wow, that is getting some depth down there then. Yeah, that 
The uh, Garrett Ace 150 is a fantastic little start machine, and uh, you know what? When people ask about starting machines, uh, whether it's for their, you know, for their child or, or you know what, they're looking to get started in the machine, uh, a starter machine, I always mention one of them is the Garrett Ace 150 or the 250. And then I also throw in things like, you know, the White's Coin Master or the Fisher F2 because, you know what, they're, they're lower price machines, they're great starter machines all around and you know what they're they're actually all all three of those that i mentioned are are made fairly well they're not top of the line quality but they're definitely good start machines and it's a good place to start off at definitely so, <laughs> let's tell about talk about some of the uh your better finds that you've actually made I, i've seen your videos and uh the one that really got to me was when you're sitting there talking about the one button that was a you know, you thought it was your first Roman coin. I just thought that was evil that they made buttons that look like Roman coins. But you know, can you talk about some of your better finds that you've made? <laughs> that button was awful. That was <laughs> that was a real low point. It looked like a Julius Caesar gold coin, but it was it was just this really cheap alloy button. It was had like a gold plate on it. Was it was oh, I've got my heart going. <laughs> well, it's a good uh, thing and a bad thing. I mean, you know, it got you excited and a little you know hyped up on the hobby, and then. then you know, a few months later, you're like, oh, come on. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so well, actually, one of the the best finds isn't a particularly valuable one, but it was my first hammered coin because it's it's a real milestone finding your first hammered coin, especially if you're hunting mostly pasture because it you just don't get many at all, you know. And, I, and it, my, my goal as soon as I got the E-Track was to find a hammered coin and I was going on club digs, didn't find any. I was going all around my local area. I was getting new sites, didn't find any. And then I think about three days after my year had passed, after my first year of having the E-Track had passed, I was out in the local field um, just on a night because in the winter I don't get time to hunt during the day generally. I normally go out 7 or 8 o'clock in the local fields. And... Um, I actually found a hammered coin, and it was it was only about four inches under the ground as well. But the the land had been ploughed about twenty years ago, and um, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was just oh wow, man, I found a Roman coin, uh, not a Roman coin. I found a hammered coin. So I got my phone out and phoned my wife, and she was like, "Yeah, so what?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and what was that hammered coin? It was an Edward the First penny. It was actually quite a rare mint. Um, it was an Exeter mint. Which makes it quite unusual, and it was in reasonable condition. So I was I was absolutely over the moon with that. It, it it's something I'll never forget, and yet it's only a tiny little piece of silver. But it was it was a real milestone. Have you ever, that's the, I, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I did not mean to interrupt. But talking about these these old coins and all, I've actually got two questions. I'll just ask them together. Have you ever found any gold coins? And also, what is the oldest item that you have found that's good? In other words. Um, it was actually the, the, one of the best things that I've found again is my first Roman silver coin. Okay. And likewise, just just like the the hammered coin, I've been all over the place looking for Roman stuff, and I found a few Roman bronzes which were really grotty. And then about two hundred yards away from my house, I found a silver Roman coin right on the top in a plough field, and oh, wow, you know, it's a, it's a Roman coin. I can't oh, believe geez. it. Uh, that was really special. It was quite early as well. I think it was, oh, it might have been, not Trajan. There's another emperor beginning with T Tiberius. I'm pretty sure it was Tiberius, which was, oh, I'll get this wrong, but I think he reigned from AD 14 to 37 or something. So it's it's coming up for 2,000 years old, and it's in pretty good condition. So that oh, was an Lord. excellent find. That's just incredible. <laughs> yeah. I've never found another one since. <laughs> oh wow! I was say I'm going actually through one of my books right now, just trying to find out that information. I see Trajan was uh, just trying to figure out when he was reigning, but uh, doesn't really say here at this point in time. But yeah, no, so I, I think it was Tiberius. It okay, was, Tiberius. I can't remember though. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll probably get it wrong and look like a right <laughs> fool. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the gold coin? Have you ever found any gold coins yet? No, I haven't. Um, Neither have I. <laughs> That's something that'll come, you know. It, it, I'm, I'm under no pressure to find one, but no. it'll come up when I'm least expecting it. You know, when I'm on a site where I'm thinking, "Oh my God, there's nothing coming up today," and then bang, it'll happen. 
Yep. So I'm, I'm, I'm really relaxed about that. Plus, it gives me something to aim for as well. Exactly. Jeff has found yeah. several. I have not. I've only found one, Butch. Oh, okay. <laughs> well. But, you know, what What you're saying is, um, you know, no pressure on it, and, and it'll come up where you least expect it, kind of like Butch's uh, Georgia button. That's right. Uh, he's been hunting hard for 50, 60, 70 years or something like that. And uh, been after uh, a Georgia Civil War era button, and he finally found one. What was it, about a year year and About a year ago, ago, within half a mile of my house. So there you go. That's the way it goes? Yes, You you find things when and where you least expect them? That's it. You find it when it's meant for you to find it, it seems like. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. It's the same with a gold ring. I've got a a lovely... um, gold seal ring that a man would wear on his little finger for pressing into wax to seal letters oh, that's uh, from the, the early 1800s and it was on a site that I'd hunted really hard with all manner of detectors and I was just out con shooting and all of a sudden I got a, a ring pull signal with the Deus, I thought mm, I'll dig it, you never know and here's this beautiful ring uh, and the, the great thing about it was it was on a, a mansion site and it was actually connected to the fella who oh, yeah. originally yeah. lived in the mansion, which was excellent. So I, I gave it to the people who look after the mansion now, and they, they've got it um, to, as a reminder of the past. That That is excellent, especially that you gave it to them too. And, and you know, people like myself, you, Richard, Jeff, most of our listeners, we see something like this. We don't see the value of that ring. We see the historical value of it, the the connection with the past. That's what's important to me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's the only that's the only thing of importance. It it's nice to have something that's of value. If you if you get a really nice silver coin and it's it's a reasonably rare one, you might think, oh, it's worth a bit that. But it's it's the historical value of it. it it's just. It's from a time gone by, and there's never going to be any more of them produced. Exactly. There's only a limited number out there. One of the things I say quite often, I've said in this show, I've said it in the magazine, when I dig up something like that, that I am probably the first person in over a century or two to actually touch it, it is actually like shaking hands with the person that lost it. It's actually a direct connection with a person that's no longer there, and it's it's really a cool feeling. It is. Yes. Oh, definitely. Uh, actually, on that subject, have you heard of something called a crotal bell? Oh, yes, I have. I've actually been lucky enough to find a couple of those up at a northeast United States site. But, yes, right. I have heard of them. They, um, is that not the bell that looks like a sleigh bell? It's a round bell? It is, yeah. They come in all sorts of different designs, okay. and sometimes they had the... The, the cattle herd owner's initials or name on, you know. The, the, some of them are absolutely beautiful. They go right back to kind of Viking times, you know, over here. Um, my county, you, oh, you hardly ever find crotal bells. There's, there's not many people who hunt this county have found one. And I actually found one in a local park when I was coin shooting with the E-Track. Uh, it was between two George II half pennies at about 12 inches deep. Wow. So first of all, I dug a half penny, and then I dug the half penny on the other side, and then I got another strong signal in the middle of those, and I thought, well, oh, it's another half penny. Dug it up, and here's this cruel little bell. So wow. the fact that it was really near those two George II coins kind of dates it. And, um, you know, it still had the little um, the little rumbler, not nut, what is it? It's like a little ball in it. And uh, I shook the, the soil out of it, and I shook, I shook the bell, and it gave a lovely sort of rumble and tone. And that oh. hadn't been heard for about 250 years. That was the first time that sound had been made. You know, it had been silenced in the ground up to that point. Oh, that and it was a special true. feeling. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's um, that's just, there's no words to describe that. I can only imagine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's something that uh, you, you can't, I've tried my best to describe it, but it, you just, you feel it, you know, you, you just feel it. It's, it's a that's lovely good. feeling. Yeah, I I actually found when uh, I was over detecting one time, I was in a pasture uh, to the west of a church that I think Henry Henry VIII destroyed that church, and I actually found a crotal bell that actually had uh, the, the little Christian cross on the bottom of it, right. and it was just Very a beautiful nice. one, and I literally, like you're saying, when I dug out all the dirt out of it, I shook it, and the, the little tumbler was still in there, and it gave just a nice little tone. I Just like you're saying, I remember that just like it was yesterday. 
Yeah, you can just oh, imagine sorry. a little paddock full of cows all moving in one direction, all making that little noise. It'd be lovely. What What yeah. were those bales used on? Was it mostly for cattle and things like that? Mostly cattle, but I think they also put them on goats as well. Okay. And I would imagine they would, they would probably put them on sheep, but sheep used to just roam wild, you know. I think they used to have them more on the on the, the more domesticated animals. Yeah, realistically, I've been thinking they're pretty much on darn near any livestock that they had out there just so they yeah. could, you know, well, you know keep track of them. One of the odd things, Jeff, and I guess both of you may know this, but um, the Native Americans, in other words, the Indians of the United, North United States, these bells have actually several, well, quite a bit have been found at their sites because they were traded to them. Now, I don't know. I suppose they actually wore them on their clothing, but they were traded by some of the early traders that came around and, and dealt with the Indian tribes. So, no right. bit of trivia. Yep. See, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, we typically hope to find uh, bells, uh, tinklers, um, yeah, trade tinklers. silver when we go out here in the West and we're looking for along those those old, you know, trails that came into the West and go around trading posts. So definitely something we uh, look for out here. Yeah, well, I can imagine the people who traded whatever they, they, they traded with the Indians would get quite a good price for a cruel little bell, considering that, you know, the the sound is quite an integral part of the the culture, and it would be a sound that they couldn't replicate with the things that they had. Exactly, and and sometimes they wouldn't even trade for good. Sometimes they'd just trade for uh, to to you know get in good with the the Indian tribe that was there, so that you know you mm-hmm. get safe passage through their their territory. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, that I don't was know. important back in the day, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Very I don't know important. what uh, is more valuable than you know saving your your scalp or, or getting safe passage for your family. So they that's, could, that's they a pretty could high have price. every bell that I had in my possession. I assure you. <laughs> yep, they could have the shirt off my back, my trousers, my shoes, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my oh, goodness. You know what? I cannot flies. believe that an hour has actually a little bit more than that has flown by right now. And it's awesome. Yeah, I could keep talking for a couple more hours, I'm sure. But uh, I tell you what, Richard, I really appreciate you coming on today. And uh, you know what? We, we love to hear the stories. And you know what? Maybe we can get you back in you know, on the show in the near future. Or maybe, you know, if you'd rather it be a, a year or so down the road, that'd be great. We appreciate you being on. And uh, if you would hold on after we say goodbye to our, our listeners, uh, I'd like to talk to you just a wee bit afterwards. Yeah, no problem. Yep. Okay. Well, Jeff, it's been fun, hasn't it? Oh, my gosh. I love I this love talk. It. I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in to another edition of American Diggers Relic Roundup. We have been here for several years on the Internet, and we'll be here for many years more. We're one of the oldest channels that I know of, or perhaps the oldest. We bring you the best in metal detecting information and um guests from all over the world so we want to thank our guest from england tonight and, and we want pl- to please check out his uh youtube channel yes, at thank you. uh thank you I yeah. know I was forgetting at something. Ponguru. Ponguru, check out the youtube channel that's richard's youtube channel and you're gonna like it and um you know something else i forgot jeff be sure and check out the american digger forum as well and the magazine but, That's folks, it. thank you for tuning in tonight. We hope that you find time to go out metal detecting, take a family member metal detecting, cover your holes, and may all your signals be good.